Anaximander. Anaximander, born 1610 to 546 BC, was a pre-Socratic Greek philosopher who lived in Miletus, a city of Ionia in modern-day Turkey. He belonged to the Milesian school and learned the teaching of his master Thales. He succeeded Thales and became the second master of that school where he counted Anaximenes and arguably Pythagoras amongst his pupils. Little of his life and work is known today, according to available historical documents. He is the first philosopher known to have written down his studies, although only one fragment of his work remains. Fragmentary testimonies found in documents after his death provide a portrait of the man. Anaximander was an early proponent of science and tried to observe and explain different aspects of the universe with a particular interest in its origins, claiming that the nature is ruled by laws, just like human societies, and anything that disturbs the balance of nature does not last long. Like many thinkers of his time, Anaximander's philosophy included contributions to many disciplines. In astronomy, he attempted to describe the mechanics of celestial bodies in relation to the Earth. In physics, his postulation that the indefinite of Aperon was the source of all things led Greek philosophy to a new level of conceptual abstraction. His knowledge of geometry allowed him to introduce the gnomon in Greece. He created a map of the world that contributed greatly to the advancement of geography. He was also involved in the politics of Miletus and was sent as a leader to one of its colonies. Biography Anaximander, son of Praxiades, was born in the third year of the 42nd Olympiad, 610 BC, according to Apollodorus of Athens. Greek grammarian of the 2nd century BC, he was 64 years old during the second year of the 58th Olympiad, 547 to 546 BC, and died shortly afterwards. Establishing a timeline of his work is now impossible, since no document provides chronological reference the Mystius of 4th century Byzantine rhetorician mentions that he was the first of the known Greeks to publish a written document on nature. Therefore, his text would be amongst the earliest written in prose, at least in the Western world. By the time of Plato, his philosophy was almost forgotten, and Aristotle, his successor Theophrastus, and a few doxographers provide us with the little information that remains. However, we know from Aristotle that Thales also from Miletus precedes Anaximander. It is debatable whether Thales actually was the teacher of Anaximander, but there is no doubt that Anaximander was influenced by Thales' theory that everything is derived from water. One thing that is not debatable is that even the ancient Greeks considered Anaximander to be from the Monist school which began in Miletus, with Thales followed by Anaximander and which ended with Anaximenes. Third century Roman, Roman rhetorician Elian depicts Anaximander as the leader of the Milesian colony to Apollonia on the Black Sea coast, and hence some have inferred that he was a prominent citizen. Indeed, various history 317 explains that philosophers sometimes also dealt with political matters. It is very likely that leaders of Miletus sent him there as a legislator to create a constitution or simply to maintain the colony's allegiance. Anaximander lived in the final few years of his life as a subject of the Persian Achaemenid Empire. Theories Anaximander's theories were influenced by the Greek mythical tradition and by some ideas of Thales, the father of Western philosophy, as well as by observations made by older civilizations in the Near East, especially Babylon. All these were developed rationally, and his desire to find some universal principle, he assumed, like traditional religion, the existence of a cosmic order, and his ideas on this used the old language of myths which ascribed divine control to various spheres of reality. 
This was a common practice for the Greek philosophers in a society which saw gods everywhere and therefore could fit their ideas into a tolerably elastic system. Some scholars see a gap between the existing mythical and the new rational way of thought which is the main characteristic of the archaic period, 8th to 6th century BC, in the Greek city-states. This has given rise to the phrase Greek miracle, but if we follow carefully the course of Anaximander's ideas, we will notice that there was not such an abrupt break as initially appears. The basic elements of nature, water, air, fire, earth, which the first Greek philosophers believed made up the universe, in fact represent the primordial forces imagined in earlier ways of thinking. Their collision produced what the mythical tradition had called cosmic harmony in the old cosmogonies, Hesiod 8th to 7th century BC and Pherecydes 6th century BC. Zeus establishes his order in the world by destroying the powers which were threatening this harmony, the Titans. Anaximander claimed that the cosmic order is not monarch monarchic, but geometric, and that this causes the equilibrium of the earth, which is lying in the center of the universe. This is the projection on nature of a new political order and a new space organized around the center, which is the static point of the system in the society as in nature. In this space, there is isonomy, equal rights, and all the forces are symmetrical and transferable. The decisions are now taken by the assembly of demos in the Agora, which is lying in the middle of the city. The same rational way of thought led him to introduce the abstract taperon, indefinite, infinite, boundless, unlimited, as an origin of the universe, a concept that is probably influenced by the original chaos, gaping void, abyss, formless state, from which everything else appeared in the mythical Greek cosmogony. It also takes notice of the mutual changes between the four elements. Origin, then, must be something else unlimited in its source, that cre could create without experiencing decay, so the genesis would never stop. Aperon, the refutation attributed to Hippolytus of Rome, I-5, and the later 6th century Byzantine philosopher Simplicius of Cilicia attribute to Anaximander the earliest use of the word aperon, infinite or limitless, to designate the original principle. He was the first philosopher to employ, in a philosophical context, the term arch, which until then had meant beginning or origin, that Anaximander called this something by the name of is the natural interpretation of what Theophrastus says. The current statement that the term was introduced by him appears to be due to a misunderstanding, and Hippolytus, however, is not an independent authority, and the only question is what Theophrastus wrote. For him, it became no longer a mere point in time, but a source that could perpetually give birth to whatever will be. The indefiniteness is spatial in early usages as in Homer, indefinite C, and as in Xenophanes, 6th century BC, who said that the earth went down indefinitely to Aperon, beyond the imagination or concept of man. Burnett, in early Greek philosophy, says, Nearly all we know of Anaximander's system is derived in the last resort from Theophrastus, who certainly knew his book. He seems once at least to have quoted Anaximander's own words, and he criticized his style. Here are the remains of what he said of him in the first book. Anaximander of Miletos, son of Praxiades, a fellow citizen and associate of Thales, said that the material cause and the first element of things was the infinite, he being the first to introduce the name of the material cause. He says it is neither water nor any other of the so-called elements, but a substantial difference from them which is infinite, a peron from which arise all the heavens and the worlds within them. Fis of FR2, Docs P476, RP16. Burnett's quote from the first book is his translation of Theophrastus' Physic Opinion from Fragment 2, as it appears in P476. 
verse 76 of Historia Philosophia Greca, 1898, by Ritter and Feller, and section 16 of Doxography Greci. 1879 by Diaz, by us driving the infinite with the material cause. Theophrastus is following the Aristotelian tradition of nearly always discussing the facts from the point of view of his own system. Aristotle writes, Metaphysics 1 to 3, 3 4, that the pre Socratics were searching for the element that constitutes all things, while each pre Socratic philosopher gave a different answer as to the identity of this element. Water for Thales, and there for Anaximenes. Anaximander understood the beginning or first principle to be an endless, unlimited primordial mass, a pairon, subject to neither old age nor decay, that perpetually yielded fresh materials from which everything we perceive is derived. He proposed the theory of the <laughs> in direct response to the earlier theory of his teacher, Thales, who had claimed that the primary substance was water. The notion of temporal infinity was familiar to the Greek mind from remote antiquity in the religious concept of immortality, and Anaximander's description was in terms appropriate to this conception. The arch is called eternal and ageless. Hippolytus, Refutation, I6, DKB2, Aristotle puts things in his own way, regardless of his historical considerations, and it is difficult to see that it's more of an anachronism to call the boundless intermediate. <laughs> Between the elements. <laughs> <laughs> to say that it is this thing from the elements. <laughs> Indeed, once we introduce the elements at all, the former description is the more adequate of the two. At any rate, if we refuse to understand these passages as referring to Anaximander, we shall have to say that Aristotle paid a great deal of attention to someone whose very name has been lost, and who not only agreed with some Anaximander's views, but also used some of his most characteristic expressions. We may add that in one or two places, Aristotle certainly sees identity interpreted with the something this week from the others. It is certain that he Anaximander cannot anything about elements which no one thought of before Empedocles, and no one could think of before Parmenides. The question has only been mentioned because it has given rise to a lengthy controversy, and because it throws light on the historical value of Aristotle's statements. From the point of view of his own system, this may be justified, but we shall have to remember in other cases that when he seems to attribute an idea to some earlier thinker, we are not bound to take what he says in an historical sense. For Anaximander, the principle of things, the constituent of all substances, is nothing determined and not an element such as water entails you. Neither is it something halfway between air and water, or between air and fire, thicker than air and fire, or more subtle than water and earth. Anaximander argues that water cannot embrace all of the opposites found in nature. For example, water can only be wet, never dry, and therefore cannot be the one primary substance, nor could any of the other candidates. He postulated a peron as a substance that, although not directly perceptible to us, could explain the opposites he saw around him. If Thales had been right in saying that water was the fundamental reality, it would not be easy <laughs> to see how anything else could ever existed one side of the opposition <laughs> the cold and moist would have had its way unchecked and the warm and dry would have been driven from the field long ago <laughs> we must <laughs> 
Or something like that. So, one of the boring opposites. Something more primitive out of which they arise. And into which they once more pass away. Eximatory <laughs> explains how the four elements of ancient physics, air, earth, water, and fire, are performed. And how earth and terrestrial beings are formed through their interactions. Unlike other pre Socratic universe. <laughs> Primal chaos. According to the universe originates the separation of opposites in the primordial matter. It embraces the opposites of hot and cold, wet and dry, and directs the movements of things and intercourse of shapes and differences in worlds that are found in all the world. For he believed there were many. And Eximander thought then that there was an eternal. The indestructible something out of which everything arises and into which everything returns, a boundless stock from which the waste of existence is continually made good element. This is only the natural development of the thought we have ascribed to them. <laughs> there can be no doubt that the Anaximander at least formulated it distinctly. Indeed, we can still follow to some extent the reasoning which led him to do so. Thales has already had regarded water as the most likely thing to be that of which all other are forms. And Eximander appears to have asked how the primary substance could be one of these particular things. His arguments seem to be preserved by Aristotle, who has the following passage in his discussion of the infinite. Further, there cannot be a single, simple body which is infinite, either as some hold, one distinct from the elements, which they then derive from it, or without the quali this qualification, for there are some who make this. A body distinct from the elements, the infinite and not air or water, in order that the other things may not be destroyed by their infinity. They are in opposition one to another. Air is cold, water moist, and fire hot. And therefore, if any one of them were infinite, the rest would have ceased to be by this time. Accordingly, they say that what is infinite is something other than the elements, and, uh, and from it the elements arise. Aristotle Physics, Written in Preller, Historia Philosophia Graecia, Section 16b. Anaximander maintains that all dying things are returning to the element from which they came. Aperon, the one surviving fragment of Anaximander's writings, deals with this matter. Simplicius transmitted it as a quotation, which describes the balanced and mutual changes of the elements, when things have their origin. Thence also their destruction happens, according to necessity, for they give to each other justice and recompense for their injustice, in conformity with the ordinance of time. Simplicius mentions that Anaximander said all these in poetic terms, meaning that he used the old mythical language. The goddess Justice, Dyke, keeps the cosmic order. This concept of returning to the element of origin was often revisited afterwards, notably by Aristotle and by Greek tragedian Euripides. What comes from Earth must return to Earth. Friedrich Nietzsche, in his philosophy in the tragic age of the Greeks, stated that Anaximander viewed all coming to be as though it were an illegitimate, illegitimate emancipation from eternal being, a wrong for which destruction is the only penance. Physicist Max Born, in commenting upon Werner Heisenberg's arriving at the idea that the elementary particles of quantum mechanics are to be seen as different manifestations, different quantum states, uh, of one and the same primordial substance, proposed that this primordial substance be called Aperon. Aneximander's bold use of non-mythological explanatory hypotheses considerably distinguishes him from previous cosmology writers such as Hesiod. It confirms that pre-Socratic philosophers were making an early effort to demystify physical processes. His major contribution to history was writing the oldest 
prose document about the universe and the origins of life. For this, he is often called the father of cosmology and founder of astronomy. However, Pseudo-Plutarch states that he still viewed celestial bodies as deities, and Eximander was the first to conceive a mechanical model of the world. In this model, the Earth floats very still in the center of the infinite, not supported by anything. It remains in the same place because of its indifference, a point of view that Aristotle considered ingenious but falls in on the heavens. Its curious shape is that of a cylinder, a column of stone. Etius reports in De Fide 371, or similar to a pillar shaped stone. Pseudo Plutarch 310, with a height one third of its diameter. The flat top forms the inhabited world, which is surrounded by a circular oceanic mass. Aleximander's realization that the Earth flows free without falling and does not need to be resting on something has been indicated by many as the first cosmological revolution and the starting point of scientific thinking. Karl Popper calls the idea, this idea one of the boldest, most revolutionary and most portentous ideas in the whole history of human thinking. Such a model allowed the concept that celestial bodies could pass under the earth opening the way to Greek astronomy. At the origin, after the separation of hot and cold, <clears throat> a ball of flame appeared that surrounded Earth, like bark on a tree. This ball broke apart to form the rest of the universe. It resembled a system of hollow concentric wheels, filled with fire, with the rims pierced by holes like those of a flute. Consequently, the sun was the fire that one could see through a hole the same size as the earth on the farthest wheel, and an eclipse corresponded with the occlusion of that hole. The diameter of the solar wheel was 27 times that of the earth, or 28, depending on the sources, and the lunar wheel, whose fire was less intense, 18 or 19 times its hole could change shape, thus explaining lunar phases. The stars and the planets located closer follow the same model. Anaximander was the first astronomer to consider the sun as a huge mass, and consequently to realize how far from Earth it might be, and the first present to present a system where the celestial bodies turned at different distances. Furthermore, according to Diogenes Laertius II, too, he built a celestial sphere. This invention undoubtedly made him the first to realize the obliquity of the zodiac as the Roman philosopher Pliny the Elder reports in Natural History 2.8. It is a little early to use the term ecliptic, but his knowledge and work on astronomy confirmed that he must have observed the inclination of the celestial sphere in relation to the plane of the earth to explain the seasons. The doxographer and theologian Aetius attributes to Pythagoras the exact measurement of the obliquity. Like for part two.